And if you want me to have a gun up here, I can do that, too. I saw that you had one on your person. I always carry one, at least. Why is that? Well, I'm an NRA personal combat instructor, and um, occasionally there are threats to, to my existence. Now, before we start, do you think we should go out and get another bottle of wine or something? Let's get going with this with what we have. And okay. We can stop whenever we want. I just don't want to, there are too many roadblocks up. I don't want to have too much alcohol in it. Though. This is fine, yeah. Because I, once I have X alcohol in me, I never leave the house. Mm -hmm. I don't need to spend 10 days in Sheriff Joe's jail. <laughs> Pumping up my brain. Ah, there it goes. Most of humans this monkey? Well, I think technically we'd have to say that all of them are basically monkeys. Their primary thing in life is nesting, digesting, and congesting. And they just have different costumes that they do it in. And they compete with each other to see what monkey is number one monkey, number two monkey, and number three monkey so on and so forth. With all the research that uh, we're now doing using MRIs, brain operates, we can see that there's th very few descending fibers running from the frontal lobes to the mammalian brain. And, but there are a hell of a lot more fibers running from the middle brain to the frontal lobes. So though we like to think of ourselves as thinking people and rational people, we have the ability to do those things. But that is not our primary mode of operating. Our primary mode of operating is a very, very sophisticated form of uh, the way monkeys and chimpanzees and uh, other animals operate. John Kennedy Toole uh, named his book, uh, his seminal book, the only one, the more famous one, Confederacy of Dunces. Mm hmm. Is, um, is there a confederacy of dunces? Is there a confederacy of dunces? You have to tell me what you really mean by that. That's very metaphorical, very abstract for me. Um, who dominates the, the planet in terms of, um, you talk about how 10% of the people, I think it's fewer, have a different type of mind. Well, DNA in and of itself has lots of options that don't manifest themselves. They're there, if you would, just in case that there is a major change that some of the uh, species will survive and be able to function in new environments. If you imagine the dinosaurs, what they might have felt like, you see, uh, obviously, they didn't adapt too well to whatever uh, changes uh, took place. And apparently, we're the replacements, and types like us are the replacements. Uh, when you say, I, I look at it this way. I, if, if you can imagine a four or five dimensional matrix with 
a hundred points on each dimension. These points are interacting at all times, always interacting. Humans have the wonderful ability and a horribly dangerous ability to connect the dots. And whatever dots they happen to connect then becomes reality. So if you want to call that uh, a conspiracy, I guess we can. No doubt there are much more intelligent people, and as I wrote in uh, Black Book 3, you can see what they're doing. They're basically exploiting the primary drives of the monkeys that inhabit the planet. You have to let's watch ads on television. Television. You have to have a new car. You have to have a new this. You have to have a new that. You have to have a new that in order to be a good monkey. So, at that sense, whether you call it a conspiracy or not, is a totally different question. But we do see behavior. And just because so much of our brain is dedicated to language, and simply because we have language gives us the illusion that we are not who and what we really are. It gives us a beautiful illusion. And no doubt there are people out there who are very well aware of that and brilliantly know how to manipulate the middle brain, the emotional brain if you would, through language and cognitive processes. If you, if, again, if you look at a four or five dimensional box and there are a thousand words this way, a thousand words this way, a thousand words that way, and you put a random number generator behind them, it will generate a bunch of words that come together to appear to mean something or more frequently appear to be a question or appear to be an answer when in fact it's purely random and has no substance to it at all. Most questions have no substance to them at all. They're primarily designed to create emotional reactions to, uh, to get the monkey to behave. While so much of the brain is uh, donated or dedicated to language ability, the, major the rest of the brain, forget he's sensing, is dedicated to motor ability. So that means all you have to do is string a bunch of words together that create certain emotional states and you will have action. That's how you get the person out of his chair to go down to Walmart and buy himself a new toy. So you, you have the words that create the affect, that create the feeling, and then from there you have motor behavior. Now the motor behavior actually can, you can have affect prior to motor behavior, motor behavior, and then an emotion, satisfaction, oh, I'm so happy. There's a relief. I've done something. I've created something. I have power. And then, of course, that wears off very quickly, like most drugs, and the person is back out there buying and doing again. See? Very few people spend their time studying themselves in detail or trying to gain more power over the three things that Robert Lintner, Dr. Robert Lintner stated, which was gravity, stupidity, and the grave. He called it the grave. And then Leary came along, changed those to uh, space migration, intelligence squared, and life extension. But it was Lintner who in the mid-50s uh, uh, in, at least in our era, said that those were the three enemies of mankind, of the human, the potential human mind. Where are we in history, in the sense of, um, we saw Hitler 
um, impose a reality on a culture that got taken over by force. America prides itself on freedom and democracy. Do we live in freedom and democracy? Well, I think the culture imposed itself on Hitler. <laughs> it was their needs and their demands, forgetting any occult explanations, which there are thousands of them, uh, that demanded the Fuhrer. Uh, the, the, the Fuhrer was simply a new religion. After World War I, the Germans felt that uh, as the chosen people, from the Christian point of view, they saw themselves as the chosen people, that Christ let them down. And a man like Hitler simply was another man who was starting a new religion. And the people demanded a God to worship. And he provided exactly what they demanded. Uh, to think that we're living in freedom, I, I uh, don't even know what the word means anymore. Uh, I don't know what the word uh, liberty means. I do know what it technically means. It's free, liberty is freedom from the government. Uh, it, it, again, it's, it's a hypnosis. It's a trance. You're free to do what you have to do. And if you don't, then the obedience police are right there. And there are all kinds of levels of obedience police. From your next door neighbor, uh, to the sweet guy running around in his little squad car. And that's what they are. It's obedience police. Obey. I once did a postdoctorate in criminal justice and the professor uh, the class was full of police chiefs from all over the world and lawyers and all kinds of lunatics. And as being one of the lunatics, the professor asked, asked the whole class, he said, I'd like you to write a about 40-page paper on a universal law. And uh, people came up with, uh, well, you're not supposed to kill. Well, we all know that that's not true. Certain tribes killing, you're supposed to kill. And they came up with this, they came up with that. I came up with one law, obey, four letter word. That is the universal law, obey. Now the professor said the paper was brilliantly done, but he couldn't agree because he was a religious man. And he believed that we had to obey God. And I said, that's exactly, he said, well you wrote that in your paper, didn't you? I said, yes. Not that I have to obey God, but human beings want to feel and act as if they're independent, powerful creatures. They dress themselves up in certain clothes to create certain effects. They do this, they do that. But basically, they're very obedient creatures. Uh, at times, they get bored every 20, 30, 40 years, and then, they do, then their next step is to go around and murder each other. That's their other pastime. So for mass man, I have very little interest in them. I try to protect myself from them, stay away from them, not be bothered by them, uh, do my work, and wherever my seeds fall, they fall. In an email, you gave me advice about keeping my thoughts to myself at work. <laughs> Do you remember the advice you gave me? Not off the top, no. It was something to the extent of that the monkeys at work aren't going to understand. And so, go to work, do my work. Smile. Yeah. I was wondering if you could give me that advice again. Well, yes. I mean, uh, it's like what I'm doing. Now, if I really sit here and care whether anyone really understands what I'm saying, I'm an idiot. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I'm not a threat. This is not my job. I don't earn my living this way. So I can contradict the advice I gave you. But when you're working with monkeys, you need to know the rules that the monkeys are playing by and what is okay and what is not okay. And you can say strange things as long as you say them in a way that doesn't uh, affect their tribal system 
and their security system. Once you start, you got to remember the primary thing is safety. Safety, safety, safety. You know, uh, monkeys and all animals as a rule, their first thing is protecting themselves and protecting their nest. And no matter how sophisticated we think we are, that's what we do. We protect our nest and we protect the things that are in our nest. So when you're working with people, uh, the last so-called real job I had, I must have been 22 years old or 23 years old, and, uh, and that wasn't even a real job because I was a researcher uh, at the uh, USC School of Medicine, so uh, at least I was with uh, uh, people who had a, uh, a broader program than the kind of work that you do, which is very different than living inside of a laboratory. Yeah. The work that I do in advertising plays into some of what um, I hope that you and I think is the evil's the wrong word, but what's fucked up with what's going on. You know. See, there we go making a mistake again. It is structure that determines function and not function that determines structure. It is the structure of the human brain. We know so much of how it's structured. But we all act as if that is not what's really affecting our lives. It is some otherworldly thing like God or mankind, good or evil. Uh, you're doing a good job in helping the monkeys fulfill their destiny. And there's no problem in that. You're also doing other things to stimulate more people who are on the edge. You might say the genetic edge. Uh, and so in that sense you are being quote helpful. Uh, but selling junk to uh, monkeys is uh, <laughs> you're dealing with at least 90 percent of the planet are into junk and Burroughs you know and <laughs> wrote about that when in the 60s I don't remember uh, you're selling junk how can you go into the human brain and change a wire that goes from here to hear, well, if a person really wants to start changing some of those wires, and the brain does grow, does in fact grow, but that's a hell of a lot of work, and it's only for the special few who have the opportunity and the will and the desire and the finances to accomplish that. Just think about it, all these billionaires with money all over the place, what are they doing with it? Are they spending it on, let's see, I'm going to be dying shortly, are they spending it on finding new drugs that will keep them alive or increasing their intelligence? You see what they spend it on, ah, like a gold-plated Rolls Royce? A towel for five thousand dollars, a toilet roll holder for ten, you know, or a prettier girlfriend, or a prettier boyfriend, or nicer clothes. So you can give them all the resources in the world, and what will they do with it? I ask you that question. They will entertain themselves. That's right. They will entertain themselves all the time. Their body is degenerating, they're becoming dumber, dumber, they're falling apart, and their only little hope for immortality is that little offspring that they may have made ten years ago who they're grooming to be a carbon copy of themselves. They don't even sit, I've known some of these people personally, and one I knew during the, the discovery he had 
a horrid terminal disease. At that moment, he started going to Europe to get the kinds of medication that American would not allow him to have here. Didn't save him, it was too late. But I told him five, six years ago, with all the money you have, instead of buying a new house for your, your 15th wife, why don't you uh, invest 25 million in, uh, or 100 million in uh, a biochemistry laboratory in uh, Switzerland? He thought I was mad. What I did with some of my royalties, in fact all the royalties of, of a number of my books, is I gave away all the royalties to uh, the USC School of Biochemistry for PhD programs. So while I don't have a lot of money, at least I put my money where my mouth is and inevitably to my best interest. I do not like having to die against my will. Pisses me off. I do not like having to be sick against my will. It pisses me off. And I don't like to be told that, oh well, you can't do this and you can't do that because I know what's best for you. It's all moral philosophy. That's all you hear is cliches. What, turn on television, watch the news, one cliche after another. You can't make sense out of anything they're talking about, except they're having anxiety attacks. That's all you know. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Billy swallowed a marble. Should we make marbles illegal? What should we do? Sh should his mother be put in jail for child neglect? What should we do? Something bad happened. Oh my God! Your version of reality is, to say the least, a minority perception. Um, <laughs> Must I respond to that? No. Nope. <laughs> Statement. Um, um, it seems to me as if... The, I'll have a cigarette and contradict what I just said. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. It seems to me as if um, uh, the... Um, in the 70s, there was a lot of countercultural material available. Um, in the 90s, there was much less. Mm -hmm. um, the obey message meme was stronger. With more, the the um, the obey police were in in full everywhere, force. everywhere. It, it feels as if they were in such full force that now their shit is breaking through. You know. Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9/11 is coming out. There, are, there seem to be more direct attacks on the Christian mythology, on the Obey mythology. I hope you're right, and I hope the next four years will be. I, I mean, to me, monkeys ruling other monkeys is rather funny. You know, and whether monkey B or monkey K is the ruler is rather funny. Now, we need father figures this sim and mother figures. This shows you how pathetic we really are. I simply rather rule myself. However, being a pragmatist, I would rather have K in office because I feel as well as I think some 40 Nobel Prize winners that he will allow science a more or less free head. And when you have people in the White House who are fighting a war against a death-worshipping religion called Islam, fighting it with another death-worshipping religion called Christianity, and you have people taking sides and lining up and murdering each other and feeling that they're here for a special mission to bring their vision of their death-worshipping religion into mankind as the ultimate death-worshipping religion, well, what can I tell you when someone says no stem cell research? 
What? Are you mad? Have you lost your mind? If I have to have a political label put on me, I would obviously be called a libertarian. But uh, I don't need any president. I just need to be left alone. <laughs> and people with talents that I don't have need to be left alone so we can work together to make ourselves whatever we really want to make ourselves into. As long as we don't initialize violence against other monkeys. But I was told by a very famous Jungian analyst that my very existence and the things that I write are a threat to the Christian monkeys, which they are, and the Jewish monkeys and the Muslim monkeys, and that I'm obligated to sit down and negotiate with them. How do you negotiate with insanity? You can't. I'm pro-life. Not just in numbers, but in quality. And for those who misunderstand, that doesn't mean I'm against abortions, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I'm pro-life. I'm pro the best of what humans can make of themselves. The best. What is a patrist society? You mean an elitist society? Robert Anton Wilson uses the term a patrist society, saying that patrist societies have more violence and shit like that. I no, that, uh, there, that word I, I've heard in a number of different ways. Are you talking about the old from the Roman, Greek? I wasn't, uh, I'm not sure I was. Uh, um, um, watching Robert Anton Wilson speak and having him go off about pastoral societies, when I looked it up online, mm -hmm. it's either dealing with the, the Roman Catholicism, right, uh -huh. um, or um, or the other side is a um, being um, short for a patriarchal. Society. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Is it the ancient yeah. term or patriarchy? To me, that's nonsense. I love Bob. I know Bob for many, many years. Again, you, everyone is missing the major key. What are you going to do about the human brain? We've had educate this, educate that. You can, edu you can throw a billion dollars an hour at educating, and it is not going to make one bit of difference until you get inside of the head. The brain is designed to survive. That's how it is designed, and that includes killing and violence. Now, as far as I'm concerned, violence only serves one purpose, other than thinning out the genetic cesspool, which may need to be thinned out again. And that's to protect yourself from, uh, quote, irrational people. People who want to stop me from writing my books, which is one of the fears that many of us have if we have another four years of what we've, what we've just had, uh, that they'll be restricting what you could write because it's terrorism. Word terrorism. Everything is going to be terrorism, I assure you of this. This gives the control freak monkeys, this horrible thing that happened on 9-11, their ultimate chance to do anything and everything they want so they can have their perfect world which ends with Christ coming back and running the planet. What, 20% of the whole world is, what, Christian, so what are they going to say? What are they going to do with the other 80%? Kill them. <laughs> or convert them. <laughs> you know, well, Regardie used to always quote, where goeth the cross, goeth the sword. Simple as that. So when Bob, Bob is very intelligent, but he misses, it's, you, 
The liberals have made one mistake. You cannot educate stupidity. You can educate ignorance. You cannot educate stupidity. And on the, on the international studies on IQ and this, that, and the other culture-free tests, it's a pretty damn stupid species. So we have to, if we're going to, I hate the word we, uh, but if we are going to do anything, we have to be doing the work at a much deeper level but people tend to use or promote what is available at the time. Like during the 60s and 70s, in psychotherapy, well, it was a behavioral, okay? All environment, that's all it is. You're just a, a monkey who is shaped by his environment. But we all know that's total nonsense. Many people knew it then. William James knew that in the early 1900s. But during this phase, of course, we have all of our new, new modern drugs and they do wonders for people who really need them. But the whole idea here is if you watch the Fair and Balanced channel, which I endure for at least one hour a day so I can feel balanced, these people are from the Crusades. This is a crusade against Islam. Not that they don't deserve to have the shit kicked out of them for initiating violence on 9-11. But this is a religious crusade, a religious war, and the people in power are as happy as hell because it gives them an opportunity for revelations to come true. And that's what they want. Are you a fan of the Star Wars saga? I enjoy it. Um, the um, a lot of criticism came of the most recent Star Wars movie, the um, the Return of the Clones. Uh huh. Um, I view the Return of the Clones partially as a lot of what you're saying in terms of of clone stupidity, just a, a mass of, of order following shit. Yeah, we're fleshy robots. Once you get rid of God, once you get rid of all of these otherworldly concepts like humanity, humanity doesn't exist. Show me humanity. You can't point it out. It's nowhere. It doesn't exist. I can show you you. You're a person. You can show me me. There's the dogs. They're sleeping. But everyone wants a cause to serve because they're idiots. The first thing you should do is get yourself together the best way you can. Find something you enjoy doing that will benefit you and those people you value and then go about doing it and let all the other people hang themselves. But frankly, they won't leave you alone. So besides the four letter word obey, I have three words I like, leave me alone. Like don't tread on me. Yeah. But they, they don't do that. What is a psychopath? The way I use it, of course, is totally wrong from technical use. But the way I use it is, is really to those individuals who... Let me ask you a favor. Mm. I'm going to try and edit me out of it. So like if I ask what's a psychopath, if you could reframe it a little bit, so, so you say, so you say the um, the question in your in your statement. Well, sometimes people ask me what is a psychopath, and by no means do I mean what is written in uh, DSM four dash R X Q Y Z. What I mean by that are marginal people, weirdos, people with talent who just can't seem to survive properly in society and who just don't fit in but who have high IQs, lots of talent and don't know how to employ it or don't know how to use it or are overwhelmed by their past programming. So one of the jobs I've chosen for myself is to provide them means by which they can undo themselves 
and start using their uh, genetic freakiness to start building a, a better word, world for themselves. No prob. So basically, I'm really talking about the extreme individual. What is the um, what is the extreme individual institute? Oh, it's something that just happened, uh, based on the Psychopaths Bible and based on the Black Books. It's a place where uh, people can get together, exchange ideas, and I don't mean argue about whether God exists here or God exists there, um, but who are interested in brain change and changing their lives, improving their lives, and improving themselves. And I don't mean by improvement, trading in your Chevy for a BMW. What I mean by improvement is to take advantage of their leading edge, take advantage of their own capabilities, their own talents to improve their existence and the lives of those individuals that they value. When I hear people talk about Christianity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and all of these other weird constructs that they have, um, it's fascinating to me how real they, they treat them. You know, they've got these labels and they interact with these labels. And I view the labels more as ghosts than the tangible ghosts. The concept of a holy ghost. I haven't seen it, I haven't felt it. Um, I guess I'm curious to what extent the entire planet is hypnotized or what the role of Hypnosis is a funny thing. People are saying, I remember one woman said to me, no one could hypnotize me. We were at a restaurant. Within 30 seconds she was in a deep trance. I put her in a trance. It's really not hypnosis which is the problem. It's dehypnosis which is the issue. We're tranced out all the time. We're hypnotized all the time. For example, you say, the, you say the word Holy Ghost to a Catholic, someone who was brought up, brainwashed in Catholicism and who's still a member. Uh, you say the word Holy Ghost and they will have all of these emotional feelings and reactions and that to them is proof. Having a feeling and having an emotion is no proof at all. I can condition a feeling and an emotion to uh, a Barbie doll, or to a motorcycle, or to a dog, or to an empty bottle of wine. But for them it's proof. Now it's fine. I let them be that way. Let them enjoy. But they miss the point. They can't leave other people out of their trance. <laughs> They want everyone in the same trance that they're in. In America we have something that they call freedom of religion. I don't want freedom of religion. I want freedom from religion. I want freedom from philosophies. I want freedom from ideologies. If I want to watch a movie and you don't happen to like it, don't watch it. <laughs> That's all. I mean, you turn on the push the off button, go buy your own television. But no, I want freedom from. Freedom from is more important than freedom to. Without freedom from, you can't have freedom to. So let the Catholics. Holy Ghost themselves to death. I do like their so ceremonies a lot more than the Protestants. They're at least, they give you a rise and a rush. 
but I get the same I get the same thing if I eat too many hot peppers a rise and a rush but once the hot peppers are digested and they're gone then it's over with but these people they want to continue it on and on and on and on um, you work extensively with uh, the Golden Dawn magic yeah, I've worked with the Golden Dawn and Magic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how much of a difference is there between the Magic and Golden Dawn and the Magic in Catholicism? I don't think you have Magic in Catholicism. Magic is a, and in a lot of ways, you don't have much Magic in the Golden Dawn or, or uh, many of the other so-called magical groups. Magic for me is specifically you, def you define a goal and you go about accomplishing it. It's not an initiation, it's not the Gnostic Mass where everyone can have an epiphany. If you want to do that, be a mystic. Go to church. Magic to me is closer to science. Whether it works or not is the proof of the pudding. Simple as that. But most of the time, uh, most of the people do not even follow the directions of the grim grimoires. They don't even put it to an honest test. Oh, it says go find an old stick from a birch tree. Well, it's too much work to find an old stick from a birch tree. I'll go find one from an oak tree because it's next door. Then they go through all this stuff. Yeah, nothing happened. Well, if you're going to do an experiment, and that's how I view magical work, it's an experiment. If you want to see if it works, you've got to do it right. One of the books, Falcon Press, is coming out. It's called Ceremonial Magic. And it's purely based on the old grimoires and with very explicit directions on how to do something. Most people who I've watched over the years, Rigardi has seen the same, and others who have done the Abramelin workings, they don't do it according to the instructions. So if you're going to do it, then do it according to the instructions. See what happens. And often real magic is a, more work than getting off your fat ass and going to the store and buying a loaf of bread. And that's why what, what you hear people call magic is not magic at all. An initiation can create very mystical, powerful feelings, much like you can get in the Catholic Church or in a synagogue on a high holiday or in uh, any religion you want to go to but that's not real magic real magic is oh I want this to happen here so these are the operations I must go through to make it happen so then you go through all those operations and see if it works if it works you have some evidence. If it doesn't work, well, <laughs> go from there. Your definition of magic seems fairly aligned with what, um, with Aleister Crowley's definition of magic. In what sense? Uh, from the scientific perspective, of uh, that magic is applied effectiveness that a magician is an applied scientist, is a natural scientist. I, I, I can buy that he may have said that, but I can't buy that that's what they're doing. If you read through their material and watch what they do, as I have unfortunately for too many years, Praying to the sun in the morning is not magic. Doing the Gnostic Mass is not magic. Doing evocations is not magic in the sense that Crowley probably would interpret it as a purely psychological phenomena where real magicians would say that they're actually in contact with other forces that exist doing their own thing on, in this pla on this planet. 
So in that sense, I would say Crowley's magic is more uh, psycho-spiritual than it is hardcore. And as I say in, in Dr. Leshevsky's ceremonial magic, he deals with this problem extensively. Are there real forces that magicians come in contact with and evoke in this, in this sphere? I've had a few experiences. Uh, and as I say, few. And I know a few others who have had experiences. Uh, psychic phenomena is a bit different than magic. Uh, that I firmly hold that the brain has a hell of a lot more power than uh, we are aware of. Gurdjieff created the concept of the Kunda buffer, which was sort of like something placed between ourselves and ourselves by training society, even possibly we're designed that way. So we can't take advantage of all the powers that our brain is, are, is capable of doing. I remember, for an example, when LSD was legal, long before it was made illegal, I had taken a very, very powerful dose and I was sitting in one room and uh, someone else was sitting in another room with a wall between us and they were holding up tarot cards and concentrating on them and I could see them. That I would call a psychic phenomena. You know, that we are capable of doing a lot more. But I don't make a big thing out of it. You know, I don't, I don't turn an experience into a religion or a belief system. What, what magical experiences have you had? You mean in terms of doing rituals? Real magic. Real rituals, okay. I've, I've done a number of them with qualified individuals and I think we could agree that we've had some uh, experiences which are out of the realm of normal uh, human experiences or simply psychology. Uh, I won't go into any of the details of the experiments, nor will I go into any of the details of the outcomes as their sort of privileged workings where there was more than one person involved. Is the Illuminati real? Is the Illuminati real? That's sort of almost like an oxymoron. Uh, I have no idea. Um, as I say, if you take a table of random numbers, start punching, uh, pushing buttons and get a lot of dots on the screen, I guarantee you someone will find whatever they want to find in it. What is the Illuminati? I have no idea what the Illuminati is, if there is such a thing. But there are people doing strange things. Now whether you want the word Illuminati attached to them or not, that's... People love conspiracies. In Black Book 3 I give a list of seven things, I believe, that are necessary uh, for a conspiracy theory to uh, develop. And I also ask the question, how many, quote, good conspiracies have you ever heard of? By definition, the word conspiracy usually means something unpleasant, something on the dark side. So shall we have a good conspiracy today? Why do you think it is that um, so many so many people? It's like Buckminster Fuller um, said that he had an average mind. He had just done unusual things with it. Do you feel that that that's true, or do you think that there are 
Well, I mean, how can you say you have an average mind and just uh, who is the one doing the unusual things in it? God. It's his mind. It's his brain. It's, it's so, so in a sense, he had normal brain functions like all the rest of us, but he also had some rather unusual brain functions. Those are nice. You see, uh, I, uh, I attended a number of his lectures, and he was a very brilliant and a very sweet man, and I admired him in a lot of ways. But like all good speakers, he knows how to mix metaphor with facts. And people love that. If you can learn how to mix metaphors with facts, you can sell anything, you can do anything. Uh, Francis Rigardi used to say, well, I'm very prosaic. And he was in a lot of ways, but he also wasn't. So by saying I'm very prosaic, he's telling me I have a difficulty handling compliments about the parts of me that are not very prosaic. He told that to you personally? Oh yeah. Well, I lived with the man on and off for years. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't feel I have a lot of talent and a lot of people feel that they don't have a lot of talent and that's probably true but at the same time I have some talent and other people have some talent. But still, my primary life focuses around nesting, digesting, and congesting. Most of my time is spent in doing that. I that may, try to do it in such a way where there's enough time left over and enough brain tissue left over where I can do other things than nesting and digesting and congesting. Not that I don't enjoy them. As a, an, a monkey, I, I would, of course, enjoy them. How did you start your Falcon Quest? Um, let's see, without violating any, anybody's. Well, Dr. Rigardi had problems with another publisher, and uh, my partner at the time and I had nothing to do. We had retired from private practice. And I said, hey, why don't we start a publishing company? I don't know anything about it. So I went out, hired a few people who knew some things about it, had them teach me. I, they kept on telling me that it takes generations, father to son, and this, that, and the other to know how to do all this. I just ignored it all. I mostly ignore that kind of advice. And went about, hired a few people who knew a lot about publishing and printing and typesetting and then we went out and bought our typesetters and our printers and started to get distribution and started publishing some of Dr. Rigardi's books which he had won back uh, in a litigation with another publisher. What is the, who is the most or what is the most talented mind that you've come across in your time? I say Leary, that I knew personally. Yeah. Uh, other people, maybe even more talented, but never got known. One of one college professor who was a total genius, and unfortunately he had too many emotional problems in other areas and uh, got himself into a lot of difficulties and never really manifested much of uh, what his uh, capabilities or talents were. Let's cut for a minute. I need to go visit the hive. Um, what transition are we going through? Well, I think we're going to be going through a major cultural war, even more so than what we experienced in the 60s and 70s. We went through one in the Roaring Twenties, if, as you recall, you were there. Um, and then we, 40 years later, uh, we started one in the 60s, and I think our 40 year, 40 year period is up. I think we're ready to go through a major uh, reality shift 
from uh, the classical belief systems of uh, religion and politics into a more exploratory universe, we're going to begin to see um, minds shifting uh, uh, more and more and more high tech, high tech stuff. And even though the monkeys use them for the same things they use everything for, some people are catching on that they can be used for other things, including changing their own brains. And I, I, I see a major rebellion, intellectual rebellion at least, taking place against the restrictive death-worshipping philosophies that presently dominate our uh, particular society. When somebody's mind becomes undone, is there a common sequence of events that happens? I wouldn't say common sequence. There are certain factors. There tends to be a uh, withdrawal period, a period of uh, withdrawing from people, social activity. And I don't mean that as a pathological withdrawal. It's sort of like an incubation phase where they go into deep contemplation, reflection, withdrawal. They still can function on their jobs, but they are they're not that interested in doing anything more than what they have to do to make uh, things happen. And during withdrawal you have an incubation and then uh, you, after the incubation you, uh, it's sort of like pregnancy, you have a birth and a breakthrough and then it's a process of uh, retraining yourself, re-raising yourself. Um, in one of the black books that will be coming out in the near future, we have uh, some, it's called Brain Pollution. It gives about 30 or 40 uh, forms of thoughting, I don't call it thinking because it's not really thinking, it's thoughting, that people use to program themselves to be stupid, even more stupid than they already are, or ignorant if you prefer. I think that's better, ignorant. And uh, so we're providing the tools. The problem is, like even with the Psychopath's Bible, if your brain is not in sync, you won't understand what it's saying. I don't mean you have to know what it says, but your brain has to be in sync with the rhythm. Because a lot of things that I write, for an example, are written in not just words, but written, as you know, with pictures, and they're also written with a music quality to them. Different that da 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 dee 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 dunk dunk. Damn it all? Yeah. Damn it all. So uh but getting back to the revolution, intellectual revolution, it's going to be impossible for the old system to hold together uh, as the acceleration of information and knowledge increases. And America will not necessarily be the place that it will happen. I see this as a dead-end country. Uh, I see this as a slave state that's going to become a techie state where you're going to have a lot of technical things being done. You know, I, I think intelligentsia and the avant-garde are going to be moving and have moved to other places throughout the whole world. And the younger generation it will do them good to learn foreign languages and lots of skills because uh, in my view uh, in another 100 to 150 years China will be ruling the world. America will no longer be ruling the world. It's a dinosaur and uh, the only hope for it is if the intellectual cultural revolution uh, does take hold in the United States and the uh, re intellectual revolutionaries are not destroyed by the uh, fascist elite.
we're at the end of this tape, so I'm going to switch up. Now this is what a Canon. Which which one do you have? It's a three-year-old Canon. Um, when I went to buy my sister um, Canon, when I got this, it was like three hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, went into the store and um, uh, they had a three hundred forty-dollar Canon. So purchased that. Purchased a mic because for interviews, you really need to have the microphone. Um, so otherwise, it'll pick up too much ambient sound without the microphone. That would be too. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get any of that since I switched the tape. Happens. Maybe God didn't want it on tape. We're going to come back to what we just talked about in a second. The last shit was just great. Um, the Seven Deadly Sins part was awesome. What I did in a notebook called Psychopaths Notebook 1 was in four parts. I won't discuss the first three parts, I'll discuss the four. I took the seven deadly sins, converted them into the uh, seven wonderful powers or seven wonderful virtues that seven deadly sins are actually given to us by God as a way to have power. And uh, that this is the true secret of all. That once you understand that God is jealous, nasty, and mean, but at the same time he wanted to help his creatures, so he called them the Sedley Devon, Sedley, Seven Deadly Sins. I discovered what he was really up to and converted him into what he really meant, which was the seven wonderful powers. Then I show people how to help people become prideful, to help other people become angry, to help them become bloodless, etc. Et so you manage of them. So that is teaching my psychopath kids, these are my promo psychopath kids, how to use God's leaders for their benefit. I wish I had a copy here, but it's on press. I'll uh, mail you a few. I'll mail you a few extra and leave them in toilets particularly if you can go to a Catholic church or two and just leave them in, in toilets. Uh, I will say one more thing about it. The first, it's in four parts. It's a very short little book. And if you buy $50 worth of books from Falcon Press on our website, you get that book for free. Otherwise, it's $6.95. Uh, but let me tell you, in those few pages, I present such encoded powerful information that I bet you 50 bucks most people will write me letters saying oh so you do really believe in God because you're using his powers I can guarantee you I will get that I'll bet anybody a thousand dollars that I get at least a half a dozen emails about that uh, I did a lot of research with rats, and in the, the Psychopath's Notebook I present some of that research. Most of that was published in peer-reviewed journals when I did use footnotes and references when I wrote. I abhor things and rarely use them. Some of my colleagues get so pissed off at me who are doctors and say, well, if you want them in there, you put them in there. So. Uh, I do point out four very distinct character types, and I use four tarot cards uh, to show the different kinds, the magician, the emperor, the hermit, and the universe. However, instead of the human faces, I put faces of rats on the tarot cards. Now, the magician is the new person. That's the leading edge person. And I describe them all. The emperor are guys like us. We're sort of uh, struggling, we're working, we're fighting, and it's also guys like Bush. 
See, because we're we're all in the same kind of group. Then we have the hermit, who is the sort of guy you shake his hand and there's no one there. Four pounds of sweat pours off of it. His complexion looks like uh, he needs to go sit under a sun lamp for 30 years. And the universe is the common guy. Then I have a couple of topics on revenge. Uh, but the real key in there is the seven deadly sins. Now I have it on computer if you want to see it. You know. Not now. Uh, so this is time for this. You've seen the movie The Matrix? Yes. Um, how, what's your take on the movie The Matrix? I have a hard time uh, understanding what you're asking me. You have to ask sure. me more specifically. Oh, happy to. Um, Sometimes I ask it really open-ended just to see if you riff. Uh, the Matrix presents uh, the idea that there is a reality that... David made me watch it, by the way, S. Jason Black. Because mm -hmm. I watch mostly John Wayne and uh, war, old war movies. I uh, don't like to think... Uh, I, I use the television like my old Zen master as a form of meditation, I go into a trance and just let my subconscious mind relax. Anyways, go ahead. Sorry. The, um, the Matrix presents an idea that there is a constructed reality that is different from what's real reality, and it shows that the common man turns into Mr. Smith, who is the dogma police. And so what I was hoping to Earlier, when you were talking about um, dogma and dogma, uh, dogma days, um, I was hoping to draw a corollary between dogma days and the movie The Matrix. Well, if you open the book, you'll see that right there. I'll show you. The FBI, no comment. <laughs> exactly. You see, we have our groups here. And then we have our four houses with the God is good, the sun shines on all, from the union man to the teacher. And then these are our organizations. These are the dogma types. We have the FDA we have the FTC, the HEW, which probably doesn't exist, the IRS, the F, which is censored, by the way. They told me I had to censor that. And the FBI, the CIA. So if you look at this little comic right here and read it, Know now that you cannot win as we are receiving help from the American CIA. So are we fooled? It's got Mongo um, Malo Gambia and um, Atos Gradia. Yeah. So there's the constant constructed realities for us, day in and day out constructs and part of our job if we want to be a little historical here is to deconstruct everything even if we have to make more bizarre constructions is my hair need combing should I put on a hat <laughs> how uh, how accurate of a metaphor for reality is the movie The Matrix well, I have a hard time uh, with movies like that, uh, probably because I'm uh, 61 years old in a few days. Uh, I saw the same things in John Wayne movies way back when, you know. Uh, The thing that concerns me about all these things is 
that there are three or four people sitting around manipulating the whole world. Uh, I just think it's the structure of the way the brain, this peculiar brain. If you want to know the enemy, look in the mirror. If you want to understand the enemy, open his skull. And you trace all, right now, if you saw that book uh, that when you walked in, what does it say on it? Uh, effective neuropsychology. Yeah. Effective neuroscience. We're now able to go into the brain and see what parts light up under certain conditions, see what, what parts dim. Uh, you know, it's just unbelievable. I, uh, I spend thousands upon tens of thousands of dollars on neuroscience every year, buying books, films, uh, whatever. We are so far behind that, in my opinion, it will take, and that's a professional opinion, at least if this planet survives uh, and this particular species survives, which is rather irrelevant to me, as it was to Dr. Rigardi, uh, before they even catch up to Sigmund Freud. See, if we were not under the supreme fascist and his morons, within 20 years we could do anything our minds could imagine in fact. <clears throat> so I've created four groups of people, as you may remember. Uh, the mutants, we're in the mutant uh, group. The anti-mutants are the ones who are running our lives. And the mutes are the food. Gurdjieff, of all of the ancient, uh, ancient, recent teachers, really had it down. He saw them for what they really were. And he threw Aleister Crowley out of his house. That's just for those people who think I'm a Crowleyite. Uh, and I may have overstated my case. Give me 50 years without the supreme fascists and we would be immortal. We could transform our bodies we could transform ourselves. We would be out in outer space for real. Uh, we would be able to do just about anything. But how do you overcome gravity? Well, you learn to use gravity, and that's one of the things you're doing. By doing the kind of work you're doing, you're using gravity. That's the mutes in order to fly because we don't overcome gravity when we fly an airplane. We use gravity to fly an airplane. Uh, but unfortunately I do not think at my age, I remember Bob, uh, let's see, Bob Wilson, uh, 1982 and we talked and he thought that he might see a lot more and so did Tim. Tim is dead and Bob is sick and the things that might be available to help Bob and the things that might have been available to help Tim, the supreme fascist and his buddies have made sure uh, that they were not available. They don't care because they're going to be with their God in heaven living forever. 
I do care because I don't trust that hypothesis. Uh, I trust quick, good minds, experimental minds, minds that are willing to, to try things, uh, to do experiments, to take a chance, and break their trance, and move forward. I'm interested in the drugged out, nutcases, and the ones, oh man, I'm free to have sex, I can have sex, wow, isn't that cool? Where do you think this repressive sexual morality came from, except the supreme fascist and his group of idiots who wanted to make sure their children were their children and not somebody else's children, so they wouldn't make an inappropriate investment? Who cares? What are the four types of people you came up with? You know, you're asking a 61-year-old man to remember what he wrote. And uh, I don't even remember what book I put it in. <laughs> Whoops. I put it in a number of books, I just don't. Which one is this? See, I decided to do booklets because I can get information out a lot quicker and a lot cheaper. While we're still doing books, of course. That's the twisted man. The world of meta puke. Well, the four types that will be in the, uh, oh, maybe I put it in here. You see, the Psychopath's Bible was written in total theory first, but nothing was dilated upon. So I got complaints, people were whining because they wanted me to feed them a lunch pail and I didn't do it so I, I promised I would do a, uh, a workbook uh, which the second part of it is and I can't keep the damn thing in stock it just keeps on disappearing and I'm wondering who's buying them I have a funny feeling they're all being bought by Jerry Falwell and uh, the government but anyways The four basic types are the magician, the emperor, the hermit, and the universe. I thought that we, um, oh, you had different four types of the mutant, the anti-mutant, the mutes, and that's different. I'm miss, no, 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 it's not different, it's different in presentation. I'm just, for, I just forgot one of the, uh, Maybe there's only three there. Anyways, these four types consist of the following. I'll just give you the basic two-letter word, uh, two sentences. Type A person is a magician. High energy, low tension. High energy, low tension. Now think what that means. The type B person, or the emperor, is high energy, high tension. The type C person is low energy, high tension. That's the hermit. And the normal person is low energy, average tension. And then I define it on cognition, will, uh, sensory motor, and emotion, and break them down. 
on that. That will be in the uh, psychopaths. Oh, here they are. The seven blessings often called the seven deadly sins. God favors the bold and strong of heart. The seven deadly sins, which we were talking about earlier, are really the seven happy powers. But we do have the mutes. Uh, oh, 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 I got it. We have the mutes. That's your average person. We have the anti-mutants which is your supreme fascist and his buddies. Then we have the dysfunctional mutants, corporate presidents, Charlie Manson, and then we have the mutants. That's the four. I, I forgot the dysfunctional group. I split uh, the mutants in two. Uh, so those are the four. What are they again? What are the four types? You have the mutants, the dysfunctional mutants, you have the anti-mutants, and you have the mutes. So those are the four groups, major groups. There's overlaps, of course. It's not scientific, it's suggestive. And what are the, each of those? Well, the mutants are people like us, and uh, Joseph, okay. The dysfunctional mutants are like the Enron guys, Georgie, okay, and Charlie Manson, the mass murderers, people like that. The anti-mutants are the uh, dogma police and all their ilk, from the highest kind to the lowest kind. And the mutes are homo normalis, Jung, uh, writes Jung, uh, homo normalis, the normal man, your guy in his little house, sitting around uh, barbecuing his children, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, barbecuing his hot dogs, uh, you know, you know, 90% of people. That's who the, uh, the, the mutes are. Uh, so those are our four groups. I knew I forgot something. It was this functional mutants, because they're they could go either way. You see. The hermits then are they a form of That's, functional mutants? The hermits uh, could go uh, are basically dysfunctional mutants, but sort of pathetic ones. Uh, the emperor types, like we are are not yet the next step, which is the magician, because we don't manipulate tension well. We have high energy, so our tension can go all in all kinds of directions, mostly self-destructive. Uh, the hermit is, just have a fantasy, the flat, sort of thin, flat-chested guy uh, imagine uh, pimples on his face at a young age that stayed for 30 years, uh, who is hyper-intellectual, doesn't understand the word that's coming out of his mouth, and can't apply 99% of anything he does. Uh, he's a guy who's truly just a legend in his own mind. And he uh, has lots of tension, but the tension is all directed inwards. It's like held within a capsule. But his ener actual real energy level is rather low. Yeah. Um, you've known me through email and through this interaction. Um, how would you describe it? 
you want it on tape? <laughs> uh, you're an emperor type. You're a mutant type. Uh, you have a quality of, of uh, flakiness. Uh, probably have moderate to high anxiety levels and that fractures some of your concentration and some of your thinking and maybe leads to some of your flakiness. You can sometimes be a misuser rather than a user. That you don't your own anxieties interfere with your judgment of what's going on. So you might, uh, uh, you, there's a mild used car salesman quality which, which is necessary for your profession. Your body type does not argue that you have any form of uh, severe innate uh, cuckoo disorder. I'm not a psychologist or even a marriage therapist anymore. My God, I can't even use my own words. <laughs> You've suggested in the past I'm passive aggressive. Yeah, passive aggressive would fit in with that because of the qualities of immense fear behind uh, being politely direct. You'd rather, uh, instead of uh, uh, dealing with the situation, you would rather just ignore it and pretend it's not there. Then it'll pop into your mind, it'll bother you for a while, then you'll ignore it again. But I wouldn't have referred you to Joe if I didn't think you were a good guy, because he's a good guy. Yeah. Joe and I are getting along well. He likes you. Um. He may be a fool, but he likes you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he may be a fool. I fancy myself a magician, but by your definitions, I'm much more of an emperor than a magician. No, 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 no. no. None of us, we don't know any magicians. They're, they're cutting edge. They're being born right now. And maybe they're 15, 17, 18 years old. You have to read the complete definition of the... Uh, I had somebody read it and she thought her boyfriend was a magician uh, until she read it, read all the little things very clearly, uh, the descriptors. They're not scientific, but uh, observations. Uh, said, oh, no, 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 I was wrong. Uh, we, we would like, to th uh, I, I frankly don't think I've ever met one in my entire life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my friend Mark Maiman is a magician. Uh, well, you'd have to read the descriptors. Absolutely. He, 99% um, of his life no, is no. spent with attention. Um, and he unintentionally just creates beautiful environments around him and create, you know, Things that should be amazingly detrimental to his career, he winds up turning into something that actually is positive towards his career. Uh, entirely unintentional. Well, you see, none of the categories are discrete. Okay. They're on a continuum. Yeah. Right. It, it, the idea is just to present a model, and I, I warn them to be careful about that. Yeah. But, but again, you know, you do the best you can. I could, I could have taken 20 years to write those things out and have developed 15 tests. There's a book written about me on there on a test I developed that was used all over the world from Russia to Australia. I developed the statistic, uh, mathematical way of analyzing data. And, but that was then, this is now, I don't have time for that. There's certain women that I meet that when I'm with them, I get a good erection and I can fuck them. And there are other women where it's like I lose my erection, a lot of times triggered by something they say or, or shit along those lines. 
and I struggle between wanting to be able to have an erection and fuck whenever I want versus respecting the physiology or biology of my body that sometimes pulls my erection away from me. Um, so I see a little bit of a fork in the road there between like this girl last night where we fucked on Friday and then last night at the wedding started talking about she brought up marriage eight times, brought up um, how special she thought I was, brought up X, Y, and Z, and I'm never going to marry this girl. I'm just wanting to get laid at a wedding. Um, and uh, when we went back to the hotel room, I, um, I didn't have an erection, even though I found her hot and had an erection dancing with her down on the dance floor. Uh, so part of what I asked myself is, is my dysfunction not having the erection when I want it, or is my dysfunction not respecting my my physiology and my biology for not giving me the erection? I wouldn't even label the word dysfunction on this premature to put such a phrase on it. We don't have enough information. Okay. That's, you see, that's part of the problem, like on that uh, dating book or whatever it is that you're supposed to be writing with me. Mm -hmm. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, <laughs> Summer's not over yet. <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know enough about your history with females. Uh, I've had. Uh, a lot of it is, is an enforced stereotype that we men are supposed to get erections. Remember the old phrase, a, pe a hard penis has no conscience. Uh, who created it? <laughs> that phrase. I mean, sometimes, as Tim used to say to me, which of course he didn't practice either, don't fuck anyone crazier than you are. We used to talk about that all the time and laugh, and because both of us did. I mean, but uh, he said that that was an ideal. Don't screw anyone. Don't have sex with anyone crazy than you. And if you understand tantra well enough, particularly if, for an example, and I'll be this is all metaphor, so don't think I'm talking truths here. If your heart chakra is open, and you fuck someone really crazy and really a piece of shit, you're going to create a connection that you're going to have to then undo and get rid of. You see what I'm trying to say? Again, it's a metaphor. It's not a uh, fact. But it, it conveys an image, you know. Uh, like if I were working with a woman in Tantra, I w the first thing I would do was work on the heart chakras together and the uh, belly areas and see how they worked and if they didn't work right I would stop the experiment at that point. They get a blowjob but <clears throat> but what other advice do you it's like when you were talking earlier about in 82 um, talking with uh, with Timothy Leary in 82 um, I talked with Bob in 82, oh, in 82. Bob, Bob Wilson, yeah. Um, Leary I met, I'm trying to think, sometime in 80, between 85 and 86, I, I, I don't recall. In 82, um, you were roughly how old I am now. You were 39, I'm 36. Um, if you, in terms of... Um, there's a certain amount of like-mindedness in us. What coaching would you give me that you wish you could give yourself for? Well, some of what I would have to say I would have to not have on tape. Why? Too complex a question. But, I, but I, if you want to put this on tape, I'll put this on tape, is A, 
get as much power and as much money as you can and then blow out of it and go develop your own little castle and your own little empire and do the things you love and enjoy and make as few compromises as you have to to do what you love and enjoy. Say. What do you think is a common thread between you, me, and Matt and me? Well, one thread I would have to say would be a uh, initial deep sense of uh, not knowing who you were and what you were and where to go and what you did and to fall into a lot of traps which is perfectly natural for people with high IQs uh, with no experience <laughs> living in a stupid society uh, along with no doubt a bunch of Adlerian inferiority complexes that were uh, I use Adlerian uh, specifically uh, inferiority complexes that there were a lot of overcompensations for that didn't work out too well uh, Shapiro really respects Adler. Part of me making uh, Jerry Rockman um, decompose in our last sessions was me um, um, analyzing Adler because I had some qualms with Adler. Um, um, was Adler misguided? Not on his fundamental principles. What he did later, he was truly insane. I mean, truly misguided. Uh, the idea that the child has to feel inferior is obviously a wonderful insight, and that that the child compensates and often over compensates. And the overcompensation can be a real danger. For an example, let's pretend you have a broken leg. You can use a cane or you can use a wheelchair. Overcompensation would be to use the wheelchair. See, you turn yourself into a cripple. Now that's how I interpret his great contribution. His social uh, adjustment bullshit, uh, I regard it just as that social adjustment bullshit. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Old Abe, Abe and I communicated. Let's see. Get the years right. I left for Toronto in '67. I communicated with Abraham Maslow in 1965 and '66, and suggested to him a book called *The Psychology of Science*. He wrote me back and said, well, you, you're going to have to do this, that, and the other, blah, 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 blah. And then the book came out. So I have a little bad taste in my mouth. The hierarchy of uh, needs, again, they're very brilliant, very good metaphors, very good models, but they're interactive and on a continuum, and they constantly interact and flow forward and backward. But when you're presenting data to people, you can't be complex. I could present you predictive data that's so damn good, uh, it's unbelievable. But uh, A, am I going to get the reader to read it? And B, do I really want to spend the time doing it? Are you familiar with the play Emergency? No. Um, Neuro linguistic programming. Is um, is that a science? I mean, the two boys, Milton Erickson. I've taken courses with. I worked with Ernie Rossi, uh, who's really one of the great minds behind it, uh, for four or five years. Uh, 
bandler and, and grinder, as I call them. Uh, I think it was a great way to make a lot of money. But Milton Erickson was a genius, and I have nothing but the highest respect for him. I've read that the that there are tests that suggest that the people that are most susceptible to hypnosis are those that claim susceptibility to hypnosis and those that ardently suggest that they are not hypnotizable. You mean both groups are? Mm -hmm. I've never met anybody who I can hypnotize. What's the function of hypnosis? How do you use hypnosis? Well, first of all, one of the functions is the word nowadays. The book I'm working on with a fellow in the Midwest, I designed it and did, let's see, what the hell is it called? Bioenergetic bio hypnosis. It's where I use, uh, the whole book is a trance. However, I interject into it the bioenergetic or uh, undoing exercises in the trance. So I said him the 80 pages, so I hate to fill in all the little details and all that nonsense, so let him do it. And I'll give him a chance to have a book and he can open a practice. A quackery of his own. Uh, what's the function of hypnosis? Well, I've seen surgery performed at the University of Toronto where I was a fellow. Uh, a fellow doesn't mean gay guys. A fellow means someone who's been paid a lot of money to go to school there. Uh, I've gotten that too. <laughs> uh, I've seen surgery performed under uh, hypnosis. Take some training. They train the persons, the people, and uh, then they actually did the surgery with no anesthesia. Total abdominal surgery. Uh, hypnosis scares Americans as it does Crowleyites, because if you're an OTO, Crowleyite person, you must take an oath never to allow yourself to be hypnotized, because someone will steal your will. So if you know Crowley believed that, you know what Crowley really was. Somebody who was frightened to have his will stole, and he thought hypnosis could do it. Wow. Uh, the idea that you can't make a person do something against their will while hypnotized is totally bullshit. You can. You simply redefine what they're doing. How long does it take to hypnotize somebody? I've hypnotized people in 30 seconds. Can you hypnotize me? And not today, because my mind is not in that space. But earlier in the day, yeah. But we've had a few wines and... I'm tired. We're almost out of tape. But yeah, well, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of believe that the people that will get this DVD are similar to me. Um, I hold that like minds attract, whether that be the psychic magnetism that I've read about or. Well, the American divorce rate doesn't uh, argue for you there. <laughs> um, but I think that the coach uh, that you give me is fairly relevant to the people that might get this tape. People will take and use whatever they can use at the moment for themselves. Few people make a study of their own lives. It's very rare. As well as living their own lives. But I love these things.
what do you think is most important, or what, not most important, that might be the long term, but um, what types of exercises do you think would be most valuable for me to do to, to enjoy my life more? Well, If we had more time, I would do a complete body analysis on you, but we don't have the time. But the, just off the top of my head, we need to get something working with your neck and shoulders. You have a very peculiar balance there, and that needs to be restructured to a bit. Uh, that's creating you some problems. And Okay, it's just a steady open one for you. Got to get a better one, dears. Hold on. There's one for you. Where's your sister? Sister, come here. This is for you. I already gave you one, Alfie. That's all. Both of you guys each got one. I know you have a short-term memory when it comes to food, but those are a few, and then also your uh, diaphragm needs some work, but it's all here now, all the details. That's the regarding papers, exercises? Well, what does it say it is? The methods here were first developed by Wilhelm Reich, that needs to be corrected, and then modified by Dr. Regardi, Dr. Hyatt, and Dr. Willis. The extensive knowledge of occult techniques and body work have been combined in a fashion to produce results unlike any other known system. No other system which includes yoga, meditation, or modern, modern methods will accomplish what this work intends. People would kill to have this because of the historical background that's involved in there. My co-author is very reluctant to have helped me with this because he sort of lives in a psychiatric model. And I don't. If people kill themselves with it, I don't give a shit. <laughs> That's their problem. Uh, no, but you see, if you follow the instructions, things will go fine. The problem is, like I had the other day, so I gave them a very important exercise over email to do and told them to follow the instructions. They did the first day. The second day they started, oh, I'm going to make it move faster. No. Did the wrong things, fucked everything up. The key behind it all is to make haste slowly. Take your time. Be kind. Give yourself permission to relax. Enjoy. Do the work. Let it happen on its own. Because if you do the work, it will happen on its own. And the younger you start, the better off, the more results you get. Because dealing with somebody like me, starting off at 60 years old, if I were to start off at that point, takes a lot more. And you don't have the stamina at my age. Where do you suggest a young mind starts? We have a 23-year-old that watches this video. Well, I would start initially with cognitive discipline. And I'm presenting some of that in uh, one of the black books. I have uh, a guy editing it for me now. Learn cognitive error 
learn tra cognitive traps or you fall into these belief systems and crap and some general relaxation exercises so you can step between yourself the judgmentalness, the passive aggressiveness learn to give yourself a break work hard, learn to play hard and relax hard plan to get out of whatever whatever you're having to do so you can have as much free time to have a fucking life a real life other than just desting, digesting, and congesting. That is if you're a unique human being. If not, everything I say means nothing. Thinking about the questions I've asked you for the last three hours, is there anything that seems misguided or that seems overly preoccupied or you wish I'd asked that I didn't ask you? No, I can't think that far back uh, and summarize that to myself. Uh, I try not to plan out anything uh, and just try to go with the moment, whatever shows up. If you were to present me with something now, I'd have something else to say, but uh, you know, I try to, no matter how hard I try and no matter how hard anyone tries, Bob and I, use, Wilson used to communicate about this, most everyone gets caught in a dogma. They want to turn everything, we're idol worshippers at heart. We want to turn everything into an idol. It takes a lot of effort not to do that so your mind is still free to find new things, explore, see new things, have new experiences, have fun. Dr. Hyatt once said three things. Make some money, have some fun, and do a little good along the way. You live by that? the best way I can. Yeah. Those are... Don't do too much good. You'll get punished for it. <laughs> well, we've got eight minutes left on this tape. We should probably get a cab. Um. Okay. Now, let's see. Let me check, see if David always uses, if not, I'll just take a minute to go in the closet and find the yellow pages. What's the name of uh, Joe's girlfriend he's bringing down? Uh, it's his ex-wife, Nina. Oh, he's meeting her here. I'm not sure how many details. Yeah. He mentioned his ex-wife was coming in, too. Never could stand the name Nina. Yeah. You? I don't know. It just... doesn't rub me the wrong way. Um, there's a, the editor that I work with. Yeah, you know, I got distracted by the pistachios. Uh, I'll leave them here if they'll get consumed. 
David will lead. Good.